Perfect. So thanks so much for your time, Dr. Linder. And um, I was just browsing your website and uh, I see you have uh, not just plastic surgery um, services, but you have products and you have a book and there are not so many people, not so many doctors that launched a book, especially in your industry. Can you please tell me more about your book? Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery. Okay, so this is the book, The Beverly Hills Shape. The Truth About Plastic Surgery. I wrote this in like, what year? 2000 and, I think it was 2007. Uh -huh, yeah, uh -huh. published in 2007. Um, and the reason I wrote it was because there were very few books that specifically told women when and when not to have plastic surgery. It, sometimes it's very important not to do plastic surgery. The truth mm -hmm. about plastic surgery, meaning not every procedure is right for every woman. Okay, Especially, okay. I'm a body sculptor, so I only do body surgery, but there are some times when women shouldn't do a tummy tuck or should not do a breast lift. And so I talk mm -hmm. about that in here, and they need to have an honest source to go to that helps them figure out whether the surgery is appropriate. That's why I wrote the book. It was Absolutely. not written to just brand me. Now, yes, I did. it was on Entertainment Tonight, on Extra, Access Hollywood, I put yeah. it on TV, but they did that when they use me as an expert in plastic surgery of the body because it gives me credibility. Mm -hmm. But I did not write this book to make money. I wrote this book to help women worldwide to understand body surgery and when and when not to do the operation. Absolutely. And uh, if a woman looking for uh, body sculpting for plastic surgery, so what would be the steps to look for and set up realistic expectations? Yeah, the number one in the United States is you have to find the doctor who is a diplomat of the American Board of Plastic Surgery. There are no substitutes, period. Mm -hmm. There is a logo on our card. The logo is a circle within a circle. I will show you this logo. Where is it? Yes, we can see that. This is the mm -hmm. American Society of Plastic Surgery, ASPS, that little circle. Mm -hmm. Doctor does not have this logo. They are not board certified, and the patient should run. Okay. So the first thing they need to do is make sure the doctor is actually a plastic surgeon. There are a tremendous number of doctors in the country, in the United States, who are doing cosmetic surgery, who are not trained in plastic surgery, mm -hmm. and the results are very, very scary. So the first thing is to make sure you're actually at the right terminal of LAX and that you're, if you're going to London, that you're getting on a plane going to London, not going to Peru. So make sure you're at a, a doctor who's board certified with the American Board of Plastic Surgery, member of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, um, and that's the first thing. The second mm -hmm. thing. The doctor should specialize in the surgery you're hoping to do. If you want to have a rhinoplasty procedure, you should not come here. I don't do rhinoplasty ever. I don't care about the nose. I never enjoyed doing noses. And so you never would want to come to me, and I wouldn't do it if you paid me any amount of money. You have to go to a doctor who specializes in the procedure you hope to do. If you want to do your breast, you come see me. Then I'm a breast super specialist. I've done 11 thousand breast implant, breast revision, breast reconstruction surgeries in 17 years. That is my forte. You don't go to a doctor who does a few each year. You go to a doctor that does hundreds of that procedure every year. Mm -hmm. The other things you need to make sure are that the doctor has privileges at a major hospital in the city that you live in. If the doctor you know, has the surgery and you have bleeding or an infection and you need to be in the hospital, the doctor needs to be able to take care of you then they need to make sure they're at a good hospital. I am attending surgeon at Cedar sinai Medical Center, which is, the, I believe, the most prestigious hospital here in West Los Angeles, Cedar sinai oh, Great. Um, other things you're looking for, you want to make sure that the doctor's surgery center is licensed. You want to make sure the ambulatory center has, like, for example, Medicare certification. My center is Medicare and JCO certified. That means we're equivalent to any hospital in the state of California with the same certification. Mm -hmm. All right. And finally, the anesthesiologist is very important. The doctor needs to be a, a, a board certified anesthesiologist, not a nurse putting you to sleep. I believe there is no substitute that if there's an emergency under anesthesia, you need to have a very well experienced anesthesiologist to mm -hmm. take care of. That's great. Dr. Linder, there are so many um, amazing plastic surgeons, especially in LA area. So what, what makes you the best? I never like to say I'm the best because 
the, because God doesn't like you to brag and be egomaniac or arrogant. Yeah. I don't say I'm the best at anything. I say I'm fortunate. I say okay, I'm very okay. well trained and I have many, many years of very intense experience of seeing thousands of surgical patients and operating on thousands of patients. And so experience and judgment allows you to make sure your patient gets the appropriate result. Mm -hmm. I believe mm -hmm. I'm an excellent doctor. I take care of my patients. I am very caring to my patients. But I don't ever like to say I'm the best at anything because I think that's a bad thing to do. It's bad karma. So I would like to say okay. I'm well trained and my only desire is honestly to get great results safely that's on great. all that's of my great. patients. That's the truth. That's all I care about. If your patients get great results, they say you're very good. They say you're the best. They praise you. So let yeah. your patients send good testimonial and praise you for your work and they refer so many more patients because they believe you're very good at what you do. Thank you. Uh, did you have role models or mentors uh, in plastic surgery and who they are? Well, my first role model was my father. My father was a, an anesthesiologist. And when I was 13 years old, at that ripe age of 13, I knew I was going to be a plastic surgeon. Mm -hmm. My father was a very well esteemed, very well established uh, anesthesiologist. He was chief of anesthesia at St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica back in the 60s. He also was a uh, professor of anesthesia at UCLA for 48 years. So as a very young lad at the age of 13, my father brought me into the operating room with a plastic surgeon at that time. And I could not believe how amazing the surgery was that I was watching. So at the age of 13, I said, I want to do this, father. I don't want to do anesthesia. It seems a little boring to me. I want to be the plastic surgeon that can sculpt and make things beautiful or normal. And so at the age of 13, my father was an initial role model. As I went on and through many years of life, he introduced me to many very famous, very famous plastic surgeons in Santa Monica and in Beverly Hills, who I observed and I watched for many, many years through high school, through college, through training at UCLA, through medical school at UCLA. I got to observe, and I'm not going to mention these people's names, but I'm going to say some very famous plastic surgeons who were hugely influential on me on wanting to be great and do great work like they do. Okay. So okay. I'm, I was lucky because my father allowed me to be at a young age to see what plastic surgery was like and to really be able to appreciate it and wanting the desire to do, to do it for a career. Great. When you have a patient that uh, wants to do some kind of procedure that you know for sure it's not going to look good on her, um, what do you do in that situation? Do you make her happy and do whatever she wants or you are yeah. trying to find a compromise? You already know the answer. You, you know who I am. You've met me. The answer is I never, ever, ever do a surgery that I do not believe is going to be the right operation. We turn patients down every week. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? I don't need headaches in my life. And patients who are unhappy are headaches. And patients who are unhappy aren't referring you more patients. They're upset. So I know that right from the original consultation. And remember, plastic surgery is intertwined with psychiatry. Self-body image is psychological, self-esteem, emotional, and yes. that is intertwined yes. with a woman's appearance of her body, breast, lipo, tummy, all these areas. You have to make sure you're doing the right surgery. If they're not a good candidate for the procedure, you don't do it. Mm -hmm. For an example, woman has three children with like a little bit bigger breast and wants them, lift, and wants them tighter and lifted. Okay, that's usually a combination of a breast implant and a breast lift. Now, the scarring on breast lifts can be horrible. They can be very, very bad. Some women do not heal well from scars. If they're not accepting of the scars, regardless of how good or bad they are, they are not a good candidate for my surgery, and I'm not going to do the operation. So they have to be realistic. If they're going to get, you know, oh, my God, if I get a scar on my breast, I'll kill myself. And they need a breast lift. Obviously, I'm not going to operate on it. Mm -hmm. And there is no compromise. There's no compromising final results. If you're going to have a woman with what we call saggy skin to the breast, grade three ptosis, where there's a lot of skin, and you think you put an implant and that's going to make them happy and lift the breast, it doesn't lift the breast and it only makes it sag more. That is a very distraught woman. And you are creating nothing but havoc. And the woman is not going to be happy. And it's not worth it for anybody. 
Okay, so basically those patients would go somebody else, and you. They will. But you're just honest. That's why you're I'm losing money. <laughs> I'm never gonna take yeah. the money. Yeah. What are the most popular procedures right now among women? The five most common, and I actually just got back in from New York a couple of days ago. I was with Dr. Oz. I'm the medical advisory board of production with Dr. Oz show, as well as ShareCare, which is um, the lar- one of the largest interactive healthcare sites in the world. And that was created, ShareCare, with Dr. Oz, Oprah Winfrey, Harpo Production, Johnson & Johnson, and Jeff Arnold, who is the creator of WebMD. So I'm on the board of both share care as the plastic surgeon and the medical advisory board for Dr. Oz. I was just there and I was answering questions like that on tape uh, just a couple days ago. So yeah, I looked all that information up. In 2013, the five most common procedures, number one was breast augmentation coming in at 290,000 surgeries in the United States. That's followed by rhinoplasty. The third most common is eyelid surgery. That's blepharoplasty. Uh, number four is liposuction, which has fallen from number two, less lipos. Mm-hmm, and then number mm-hmm. five is facelift. So, again, most common yeah. is breast, then nose, eyes, um, liposuction, and number five is facelifts. How about and, men? Do they also get surgeries in your office? Yeah, we do male liposuction uh, quite a bit, more than ever. And we do quite a bit of gynecomastia surgery, which is removing skin and breast tissue uh, through a small incision under the nipple called gynecomastia tissue mm-hmm. and liposculpture of the chest. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I'm curious, do you advise, when somebody comes uh, really overweight and people want to look great, do you advise them on uh, changing their lifestyle and diet and exercise or um, they get offended and you just do your job and uh, offer them right. plastic surgery? Yeah, you, again, you already know the answer. I do not operate on morbidly obese patients. They need to get close to their ideal body weight. Otherwise, it's dangerous. There's more mm-hmm. risks in, under general anesthesia, and you can't get a great result. Okay, so okay. the answer is no. But listen, there are women who are slightly, you know, somewhat overweight, and they've tried for years to lose the weight. And sometimes we have to do some surgeries if mm-hmm. it's a functional operation. And those are two examples. One is massive breast reduction. That means a woman is breasts are so large that she cannot wear a bra, that she has grooving in the shoulders, that there are rashes underneath the breast, and she, she's in pain all day and night. Those women will go ahead and will operate in the hospital in a setting that is safer and there's more emergency care available if we need it. Yeah, and yeah. those patients, you know, also if you need blood transfusion, will do massive breast reductions for those women that absolutely cannot lose weight after giving it a reasonable attempt. Another is called a paniculectomy. Paniculectomy are women with massive stomachs. It's an enormous tummy tuck and that is, again, functional, removing all that weight from the lower abdomen uh, as well as reducing rashes and infections in the lower mm-hmm. suprapubic area. Okay. Um, for the breast implants, uh, there is always controversy between silicone and uh, uh, saline solution. What is your yeah. thought on that? Well, behind me, you can maybe see some of the implants. <laughs> yes. I do both sil- silicone and we do saline. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay. We do them both. There is no controversy, really. The FDA in 2006 reapproved both silicone and saline was already approved, but silicone mm-hmm. was reapproved in 2006 for women who are over the age of 22, for women who do not have any autoimmune disease or active cancer. Those are women that we can put silicone implants in. I use both every mm-hmm. week. I love saline. I love saltwater implants. I think they look gorgeous. They're beautiful. They, if they rupture, it's just salt water. I have no problem using saline. I am not a guy who's trying to sell silicone implants to every woman that walks in the office, especially the younger women who haven't had children yet. I am more than happy to use saline, submuscular, on a lot of women who are mm-hmm. 18 to the late 20s. Once women have had kids and they want the most natural implants, we go ahead and we use the silicone cohesive implants, mm-hmm. and that's fine. That's but, but silicone does not cause cancer, and silicone does not cause autoimmune disease. That is a fact. Thank you. Um, I have noticed you also have your own line of products that you offer, um, sports, uh, sports attire, sports bras, and yeah. others. 
um, are they for women that already had breast implants or they, they are suitable for anyone? There are two different bras that I have created. The first is called Dr. Linder Bra. The Dr. Linder Bra is a post-surgical patent pending bra that I created because there were no good bras that I could find on my patients post-surgically anywhere. Mm -hmm. I looked mm -hmm. at all the different bras the patient would wear, bring in for after surgery, and none of them were really great. So the Dr. Linder bra, I created that bra specifically for post-surgical, but a lot of women enjoy it, and it's so comfortable, they wear it as a sleep bra at night as well. The specific um, uh, points to the Dr. Linder bra that are a little bit, um, let's say, original, and kind of, uh, kind of, you know, more useful for post-surgery are the, the front of the bra has a double clip zipper mechanism. We call it the clip clip zip. And it's easier for women who have just had surgery to double clip a bra and then be able to zip it. The zip alone bras are more difficult to put on and they're difficult when you've just had cancer surgery, breast reconstruction, breast lifts and all types of breast implant and mm -hmm, breast mm -hmm. implant revision. So double clip zip in the front. There's also a special padding along the, the middle of the chest that allows for comfort as well. Okay. The sides of the bras have um, straps that can be adjusted. They're adjustable straps up to one and a quarter inches, and that's important. So early phases of postoperative swelling, there's going to be expansion of the lateral or the outer chest. So you want to put those clips at a further lateral position. As the swelling is resolving over the first two to four, two, three, four weeks, you can then clip the bras in closer on the side so it tightens it up and it reduces edema. So it's more of a compressive bra as well as uh, it, it reduces edema, swelling, and it's extremely comfortable. The inner lining is cotton. The outer portion of the bra is spandex for stretchability. The inner lining and the spandex allows breathability so that when women are perspiring, they don't get staph infections on their incisions or they don't end up with types of waterborne infections. We want to reduce infections. We also want to allow for breathability and stretchability and it has to be comfortable and it has to be something that women can put on easily and that's why we, I put all those little things on it. Mm -hmm. that's One great. last yeah, one last thing about the bra. The bra is fit specifically by chest diameter. It is not fit by cup size. If a woman is a 32B or a 32D, she will wear a small bra, the same bra. It has to do with the chest, not the bra size. Okay, that's great. Dr. Linder, you are obviously not just successful doctor, you are also an entrepreneur by creating products as well as an author. What is your personal life philosophy on success? <laughs> success specifically is something that you achieve by working hard at it every single day. For me, it's patient to patient to patient. It's each patient doing the best you can on. It's branding who you are and what you do. One thing I did very early on in 1999 two years after coming out of my fellowship in plastic surgery was I gave up facial plastic surgery altogether. I became the body guy. I became the, one of the top breast surgeons in the world. I was doing between five and 600 breast surgeries alone, not including tummy tucks and liposculptures. But by finding myself as a specialist and not being the jack of all trades, oh, I can do everything. Today I'll do a face. Tomorrow I'll do a nose. The next day I'll do a butt lift. That makes you great in, at nothing. Nobody knows who you are, yeah, and nobody yeah. knows that you're a super specialist at anything. If you want to be a specialist, you have to give something up. You can't have everything. Oh, be the crazy. best of, of something, but don't be the best of everything because nobody's the best at everything. And when you, as a surgeon, you specialize in something, and you do it thousands and thousands of times, you see all the different variations in the human anatomy, and you're able to understand it better than the average Joe to a point where you can really make a great result, where you can really, really see the little fine-tuned differences that the next guy can't because they're not doing thousands of breast revisions and breast reconstructions. So I think the, the key to my success early on for sure was specialization. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Linder. Is there anything else you would like to add to your future patients? 
No, there's not a whole lot. You know, I enjoy, I just enjoy doing great surgery, taking care of my patients. They're number one. Um, and working hard and just doing great results. You know, I'm a family man. I'm lucky. I got a wonderful wife, two kids, a boy and a girl. And um, I just feel very thrilled, honored, and blessed to be able to. And it's a privilege to operate on a human body. It's not a gift. It's not given. It's a privilege to be able to be a surgeon of any sort and be able to have the honor to operate on a human body and a woman and be able to for them to bestow their confidence in you to do great work on them and to change them for the better. One thing you should remember about cosmetic surgery, one professor told me when I was in San Francisco, he always said, this is the only field, plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery, part of plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery, where you're taking somebody usually that's totally normal and you're trying to make them look better. That's like the, there is no other field in the world like that. And it takes a lot of, you know, integrity and it takes a lot of backbone to try to take something that isn't broken and make it look better. And that's what we're doing as plastic surgeons. And so it's something that we have to, you know, have humility to, to do this for a living. Mm -hmm. oh, well, 